Jesus was 100% God and 100% human at the same time. This paradox is called the Incarnation, which we often talk about at Christmas time. Mark has spent most of chapter 5 describing for us the implications of being 100% God. And now Mark is going to switch gears and share with us the implications of what it means to be 100% human. Today's passage reminds us that Jesus had a hometown, and that Jesus had a family growing up, and that Jesus worked for a living. There's a lot to unpack here in these first six verses of Mark chapter 6. So let's read our text and pray. This is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the village's teaching. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, once more we ask, please grant us the gift of your spirit and help us understand this passage better. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Nazareth. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. You mean Jesus had a hometown? Yes, our hometown is that place where our father and mother lived and worked during the first years of our life. It's where we went to school. It's where Jesus worshipped in his local synagogue. In hometown is that place where we played with the neighbor kids. These early years of our lives are often called the formative years because early memories are carved into our souls to set in stone our likes and dislikes, our preferences and druthers, our language accent, and the quirks of our personalities. Jesus had a hometown, and he knows that you have these same formative hometown memories as well. And Jesus had to leave his hometown, and it was probably just as difficult for him as it was for us. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. And like for most of us, Jesus' hometown was just a memory. People die or move away, places change, the seasons of life cycle in and out over and over again until your hometown is gone and everything is different. Your hometown exists for you, preserved only as a memory in your mind. After John the Baptist was imprisoned at Tiberias in Galilee, Jesus knew it was time to put his hometown behind him. And so from that point on, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If you recall, Jesus had just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead after that brief interruption from the woman whose bleeding problem was healed in the midst of that crushing crowd. Mark gives us this last part of verse 6 to let us know that it was time for a change. Jesus was embarking on a tour of Galilean villages, and he was going around the villages teaching. It's only fitting that Jesus visit Nazareth first. They deserve this hometown privilege. Which brings us to several important questions. How many times did Jesus make official visits to Nazareth? When were these visits and how was Jesus received at these visits? Scholars have tried to harmonize the Gospels to arrange their accounts in the most likely chronological order. But sadly, there are several accounts which they are still unsure of and this here is one of them. All four Gospels make it clear that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, and then after he went to Judea to be baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River and then be tempted in the Judean wilderness, Jesus set up his home base of ministry in Capernaum. The trouble arises when Luke records a detailed visit to Nazareth in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30, immediately after Jesus' temptation and before he calls the first four disciples in Capernaum. In Luke's account, Jesus makes it abundantly clear that he's not just another Nazarene, but he is the Messiah. And the people of Nazareth are especially lost and need to trust him as their savior and not just their hometown homie. But I say to you in truth, 
There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. His hometown people weren't too bright, but they did pick up on his inference that the reason so few miracles were being done in Nazareth was because they weren't worthy either. That visit almost ends with the people who heard him preach throwing him off a cliff. Now, Matthew's account is almost identical to the account we have, we're studying today, right here in Mark. Jesus has already called his disciples, and they are following him on the day-long hike from the coastline of the Sea of Galilee up to Nazareth. Teaching. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Here you see why two visits to Nazareth is so troubling. Why would they invite Jesus to speak in their synagogue when merely months before they had tried to murder him for what he said to them in the synagogue? We need to move on, so I suggest we leave questions like this for Jesus the next time we see him. But I'm going to assume Mark has explained to us the first visit he's made to Nazareth, just as Matthew appears to assume. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue. There's no better welcome than to return to your hometown and be offered a chance to preach in your own local synagogue. I'm sure they expected a nice little preach where Jesus thanked them profusely for all those years of support and encouragement and how he came to be who he was because of their prayers and generosity. Jesus' popularity made Nazareth, a little town of ill repute, world famous. But instead of a key to the city acceptance speech, Jesus' words astonish and offend them astonished. And many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Everybody is astonished who hears Jesus speak and witnesses the power of God. Jesus's first visit to a synagogue back in Mark chapter 1 resulted in this same level of astonishment, but nobody at that worship service asked questions like these. The people of Nazareth were so familiar with Jesus that they didn't for a second think that he was God or that God had given him this wisdom and power. It never even crossed their mind. Nobody was on their knees with the fear of God that day. Jesus was just their little Jesus to them. Offended. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Think about it. We're all guilty of saying these kinds of remarks. Whenever we welcome someone back to their hometown after being gone for years, aren't we eager to embarrass them with humbling little slights like, I knew that rascal when he was sucking two fingers in a diaper. Or, I used to give that young lady piggyback rides. Comments like these are actually subtle boasts meant to steal the glory of maturity from those we knew before they came of age. In all these awkward conversations, we expect that hometown visitor to shyly blush and look down as we knowingly wink and nod at each other. It's all a little game, a passive-aggressive game of force, meanly designed to say, don't you dare forget who we are. We can humiliate you anytime we want to. But you can bet Jesus didn't give them that satisfaction. In return for their familiarity and the intimate knowledge they had of his early life, Jesus stuck to his mission. He was there to share with them the gospel of repentance first. This was their only privilege as fellow Nazarenes. Nobody likes a young upstart whom you've helped become who he is today, returning back to tell you how to live. This is offensive. Jesus was just a lowly carpenter, the bottom dweller on a social ladder of the city, and now he's returning as Lord of the universe to preach repentance? The Nazarenes don't take this very well. There are a couple of side notes we need to discuss before moving on. First, here Jesus is called the carpenter. In Matthew's account, Jesus is referred to as the carpenter's son. Is this not the carpenter's son? 
Surely Joseph would have taught Jesus the trade of carpentry, making Jesus the employee of nearly everyone in the community at one time or another. It's hard to imagine Jesus once worked a customer service retail position, but it's very likely he had to deal with customers just like we did. Jesus knew how to work hard and earn a living. He knows you get up early and that you stay late to meet deadlines. Jesus probably worked first for his father, but by the time he had to leave to start his gospel ministry, Jesus was the oldest and probably the primary breadwinner, bringing an income home for his mother and perhaps some half-siblings in the family. Which brings up our second side note. Did Jesus have brothers and sisters? And by that, of course, I mean, did Jesus have half-siblings who were born of the same mother and the father was Joseph? Well, Mark here mentions four brothers by name and at least two sisters. And Matthew agrees, listing the same four brothers and sisters that Mark does. Mark already mentioned Jesus' brothers back in chapter 3, but when we covered that, we just skimmed right over it quite quickly. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. After attending Jesus' ascension from the Mount of Olives, Luke records those who began gathering. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These, all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers." Before I review for you the Catholic Church's interpretation on this matter, let's just make it clear that these differences are not disagreements with eternal circumstances. Both sides of this disagreement are going to cling to their interpretation until other far more important differences are resolved. The Catholic Church's interpretation revolves around the meaning of two words, brother and sister. Do they always mean biological siblings or can they be extended to other family members like what we would call today cousins? All church scholars agree that the Holy Spirit didn't impregnate Mary more than once and the Holy Spirit didn't impregnate any other women except Mary. So we're definitely not talking about other children fathered by the Holy Spirit. We are talking about the issue of Mary having other children by Joseph. The question then becomes, what creative ways are there to explain how residents of Capernaum called those of Jesus' family brothers, and how Luke noted that Jesus' brothers were present in the upper room, and how residents of Nazareth in our text today were intimately familiar with Jesus' four brothers by name and with his sisters. The Catholic Church claims that in Jesus' day, the terms brother and sister could be used to describe cousins. So if perhaps Mary or Joseph had a brother who married a woman, their sister-in-law, and had sons and daughters, then if Mary or Joseph's brother passed away, Joseph, Mary, and Mary's sister-in-law could have raised their families together with many cousins living together in the same house. Another theory often argued in this debate is that Joseph was a much older widower and had children from a first marriage at the time he married Mary, explaining why Joseph had passed away before Jesus began his public ministry. An even crazier theory sometimes mentioned is that Joseph, in essence, had two wives, siring children through his deceased brother's barren wife in accordance with the law of Moses and the Leverite rule, of family name perpetuation. Do an internet search on the brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will find many articles advancing both sides of this debate. Honor. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. In modern times we would say familiarity breeds contempt. Another adage which may apply is, it's not what you know, but it's who you know. How many times have even casual relationships been a blessing to us all? It's such a powerful gift to send an email or call someone with a favor or a question and receive free advice and expert counsel just because we're familiar with them, just because we're friends. 
Now, people of Nazareth, like so many of our family and friends, have become grace and favor leeches, expecting the rich and famous to share their bounty with them just on the basis of familiarity. But Jesus didn't come to save those who were part of his mafia family. Jesus came to save those who believe he is God and was sent from a loving God to die for them on the cross. Yes, we do have a friend in Jesus, but don't believe for a minute that he's saving you because you're friends. He is saving you because you put your trust in him and that you believe in him that he was going to purchase you from the domain of darkness. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Don't get comfortable with Jesus until you sense the conviction of how far away you are from Jesus. Jesus isn't your savior until you realize that all the base functions of your soul are at war with God, until you understand that death is your deserved courtroom sentence, until in desperation you cling to Jesus and trust completely in his mercy. Then Jesus, friend Jesus, will be with you. Unbelief. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. I'm sure at one time or another you've run into some well-intentioned people who might say something like, you would have been healed by now if you only had faith. The lack of faith in Nazareth was clearly the reason why Jesus was unable to do much good in his hometown. But don't get confused, there are two distinct classes of belief. The one kind is demonstrated by the born-again child of God waiting on God and trusting him completely to bring about their healing either here on earth or someday in heaven. And for the faithful, it really doesn't matter which. Unbelief is not the reason why they haven't been healed. They completely trust God for something that's even bigger than their own healing. The other kind of belief which Jesus marveled at was the belief that Jesus was just a famous man, the little lad Jesus, all grown up and returning back to his hometown proud. Their familiarity formed, a blo formed an anti-faith blockage to true faith. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. God doesn't just drop in on a meeting of atheists and start healing right and left. A wrong perception of Jesus, one that envisions him in any other way other than the way Scripture and the Holy Spirit reveals him, is a perception that Jesus calls unbelief. The people of Nazareth had stumbled upon a new flavor of the unpardonable sin. They had invented a Jesus who couldn't be God, who wasn't empowered by the Holy Spirit, and wasn't on a love mission to save them because they didn't need saving. The gospel is simple once you get the picture straight. Our hearts are so broken that we are dead to God, and we will be dead for eternity unless we repent of our sin and put our trust in Jesus, welcoming God's word into our minds and God's Holy Spirit into our hearts. Don't be like the people of Nazareth. Get the picture straight. Heavenly Father, if we become too familiar and if, if we begin to expect you to bless us because of our position of pride in Christ, Father, help us return to our first love and trust you with a childlike faith. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.